Hello, I'm Jim Morris. I'm a writer and television producer now, but I used to have one of the really great jobs. I was a captain in the U.S. Army Special Forces. Everybody knows the legend of the Green Berets, but not very many people know the reality. We're going to show you the real Green Berets, who they are, where they come from, what they do, and how they do it. Special Forces is an elite corps of soldiers, highly trained and language qualified. They organize, train, and direct both guerrillas and counter guerrillas, as well as conventional troops. They also perform various direct action and commando missions. They are especially important in the post Cold War environment because, as U.S. troops are reduced in numbers, Special Forces act as force multipliers. When they train Allied forces to defend themselves, we don't have to send U.S. troops to do it for them. We probably have uh, right now, oh, somewhere in the vicinity of the 2,500, 3,000, 2,800 Special Forces soldiers probably deployed in 30 to 35 countries worldwide. And that's a snapshot in any given day. You, you can, you can, that, that, that's been pretty constant over the past year. Uh, what are they doing? In South America, they're doing primarily, or do, doing a lot of work with uh, South American forces, again, foreign internal defense forces, uh, from, the, from you know, various countries within the, the South American region, uh, counter-narcotics, counter-drug operations, which again, uh, teaching those forces that you're talking about patrolling, uh, you're talking about uh, those kinds of things that associate themselves with a, a force being able to, number one, uh, uh, determine where a, a, a target site might be, the ability to move that target site and take that target site down. We don't, by the way, participate in any of the operations where we're banned from doing that, but we certainly can prepare host nation forces to do that. In Europe, the 10th's been very busy in, in Turkey in provide comfort. They're doing a lot of contingency planning for other areas uh, in, in Europe as well. Uh, in the Pacific, they spend a lot of time in Thailand, uh, Korea, some of the islands, Malaysia, they move in, in and out of Malaysia occasionally. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of activities going, going on worldwide. Uh, of course, the fifth, they're back uh, in their AO right now. Uh, as we speak, there's uh, some guys in Somalia uh, helping there with the, uh, uh, with the peacekeeping uh, efforts, as well as the humanitarian efforts that are going on uh, in, in, in that country. So there's a lot of things going on. Becoming a Green Beret is more than a matter of seeing your local recruiter. SF is a professional organization, and the enlisted men are sergeants and above. The officers are at least captains. They are all paratroopers, exceptionally physically fit, and the intelligence requirements would get you into a good college. The standards in SF, they, I believe, my opinion is they're very high, they're very good. I've been told that less than 1% of the Army is even eligible, and of that, only like 1.5% actually even tries out, and obviously even less or ever made it all the way through to where they get to wear the tab in the Green Beret. The program we started with, started with 85 people, started my class. And 17 of those are graduated from the original class, just to give you an idea of the attrition rate there. Special Forces inherited both its mission and its personnel standards from the World War II Office of Strategic Services. Retired Major General Jack Singlaub was a young lieutenant when he joined OSS in 1943. We had a gathering of people that were uh, of like mind, uh, both on the uh, U.S. side, and then we were uh, turned over to the British. So 
we were involved in a program called the Jedberg program, which involved actually five nationalities. Uh, we had a, a team of three, which consisted of an English-speaking officer, either an American or a Brit, uh, plus an officer of the country that we would go into. And there were a few Dutch and uh, Belgian uh, teams, but the majority of them were uh, French. I had a French officer and an American radio operator, sergeant, uh, with me on my team. We trained as a team and eventually parachuted into occupied uh, France. Uh, and uh, uh, we had a reception committee there of a French agent who introduced us to someone that uh, was starting a, a good resistance uh, force. Uh, we then worked with him, trained his uh, troops, brought in supplies to arm him, taught him how to use the equipment that we brought in, and then uh, helped him plan uh, specific operations against uh, the Germans, who by this time had been hit on two fronts. Uh, we jumped in just before the invasion in the south, and our job uh, for some time was to prevent the uh, Germans from escaping from uh, uh, the Atlantic uh, coast ports of, of France. Ambassador William Colby, former director of the CIA, also led a Jedberg team and went on to a direct action mission. Special Forces today do a lot of different things than, than I did then. Uh, obviously, they do particular operations attacking certain objectives and that sort of thing, which I was not doing. I was a high-level high liaison officer is what I was as a Jedberg. I went on to a more of a, what might be called a modern day special forces operation when I went up to Norway and took a team of people up there to sabotage a railroad. There was a railroad running from North Norway down to the south that the Germans were moving troops along and we wanted to delay that movement of the troops so they sent a, a Norwegian operational group it was called, it was a group of about well, we started with 30, we actually got about 15 or 20 into the mission. And uh, we operated alone, but gathered with some of the Norwegian resistance. We lived high up in the mountains, and then we'd come down and blow up the railroad and run away as fast as we could. But that was not an effort to raise resistance generally. It was a more directed, sabotage mission, which again is a typical special forces mission today, I think. OSS's unique requirements, intelligence, physical fitness, and language skills drew people with extraordinary self-confidence and a cosmopolitan background. OSS was to some degree, you might say, a socially inclined organization. Because at the administrative level, it had a large proportion of the daughters and sons of society people. It was the in thing at the time to be an OSS for the upper 400. But among the military that were assigned to OSS, we had the standard discipline, respect for uh, our superiors, and so forth. So it was a sort of a mixed organization with a tendency at times to be a little freewheeling. During World War II, OSS performed all our clandestine activities in a spectrum which included commando operations at one end and undercover espionage missions at the other. It is really a brotherhood of daring, dedicated, highly motivated, 
soldiers, soldiers who are willing to accept calculated risks, risks that extend far beyond the normal call of duty, risks such as jumping and operating behind the lines. But then one can say, what's so remarkable about that? The conventional airborne and the marine recon troops, they do the same thing. Yes, they do. But special forces go beyond that. They operate deep in enemy territory, right into the enemy heartland, and for indefinite periods, not two or three days, but for weeks months or longer, and they operate in those areas when required in civilian attire and in enemy uniform. After the war, the espionage activities were assigned to the Central Intelligence Agency. The guerrilla warfare and commando missions were passed on to special forces. Right after the Korean War it was just ending, they were looking for uh, people to come to, to this new unit. So I was looking for a change because I was bored with being in one unit doing the same job. And uh, so I was, since I was jump qualified, I was medical qualified, and I was bilingual, I said, uh, I'll look into it. So I put in an application, and I was one of the first 100 to show up at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in 1952. And uh, the reason I joined it, really, because I was bored of the regular army doing the same thing all the time. And I heard that in this unit, you're going to do one of many, many different things and a volunteer for everything. The thing that struck me the most was the senior NCOs, the master sergeants, the sergeant majors. They were so much different from the other senior NCOs that I met in the regular army. Uh, some of them were in Merrill's Marauders. Some of, them, some of them had been in Darby's Rangers. Some of them had been in the Special Service Force. Um, a lot of them, I've known, were from different armies. In those days, they kind of said that we were the Americans' foreign legion because we had so many people from different countries in special forces because of the language capability. And these senior NCOs they were different. They were not trying to put on a show. They were not trying to boost their ego and show you how much they know. They didn't fill you to uh, fill you up with rah 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 stuff. They said, "This is what I want you to do," and they left. When they came back, they expected it done. And if you cannot adapt, if you cannot be creative, you needed to go someplace else. The formation of special forces was not greeted with universal enthusiasm within the military establishment. An organization like the Army, entrusted with millions of lives, is inherently conservative, and like the Air Force before it, special forces had to prove itself. You know, many people in the armed forces believe that it weakens the total force if you take all of the best soldiers and put them in an elite uh, unit where they might not be, uh, be used, that, that quality should be distributed. And that was the view of General Abrams. He expressed that to me many times to explain why he was opposed to uh, special uh, forces. This situation changed dramatically when John F. Kennedy became president. President Kennedy was the first one, I think, to recognize that 
counterinsurgency was a viable strategic concept for the United States. In other words, if there were movements that were aimed at bringing the government down and the government government stability was in your interest to, to maintain, then there might be ways to support that government uh, and, uh, and keep it in power without having necessarily to go to war. And so Kennedy, uh, uh, I think, felt that the special forces might be an instrumentality through which counterinsurgency could be first learned by our own forces and then taught to others to bolster governments under siege if they were governments that would be in our interest to keep intact. Special forces adopted the beret from the British commandos with whom the OSS had worked in World War II. But for a decade, Green Berets were an unofficial insignia worn on training exercises. Kennedy's sponsorship changed that. His military aide, General Chester Clifton, was a classmate of mine at West Point. And Clifton paved the way for the president's visit by coming down to see me first. And we decided that when the president arrived down here, he really wanted to see special forces and that we should have the special forces come appear before him with the Green Beret. Uh, my uh, concern was initially that uh, this is non-regulation and the Army is not going to be happy about it. But then when I began to think, if the president is for it, who can stand against it? So uh, we found berets. They came out of packs. They came out of uh, uh, dime stores. They came from all over the place. And when the president appeared, we had the Green Beret. I briefed the president on the, on the special forces. Uh, he, uh, he was, I guess, his physical condition was such that he didn't feel like walking along a, an entire line to inspect. So I had a series of flatbed trailers with uh, A detachments with uh, all of their equipment and speaking in various uh, foreign languages pulled by the president. And it was a most impressive show, I can tell you, and all in their Green Berets. And I said to Clifton now, when you get back to Washington, make sure that the president somehow corroborates this in writing so that uh, the, the beret will be, uh, will be approved. And that's, that's the way it occurred. The role Kennedy perceived for his Green Berets was as counter guerrillas in Southeast Asia. In the light of our founder's view of that conflict, this has to be ranked among the ironies of history. There was one period when I spent some time with Ho Chi Minh, and he told me that he wanted to gain full independence from France, that they'd been under French rule for 75 years, and they'd been milked by the French all that time. Now, that was exactly President Roosevelt stand. He said that he would never let the French return if they returned there as soldiers. He would never let France take sovereignty over Indochina again. It should be an independent country. Ho Chi Minh told me that he trusted the Americans because we were not colonizers like the British and the French. We had freed Cuba and we were going to give the Philippines their freedom in 1946. And he said he wanted our help, financial, economic, military, anything that would keep his country free. He leaned heavily to the United States. I wrote a report on that. But I'm sure it wound up in file 13 in the State Department. Anyway, for one week, a couple of whiz kids from the State Department visited Hanoi 
and then went back to Washington and reported that we should support our ally, the French. And we did, with munitions and arms. And that threw Ho Chi Minh in the lap of the Soviets. In spite of Colonel Banks' reservations, we did go to Vietnam, most of us many times. When it started, Vietnam was one of several commitments in Southeast Asia, most of the others of which were resolved successfully in our favor. Only Vietnam grew into a quagmire of epic proportions. When we first went to Vietnam, we trained Vietnamese special forces and rangers. In 1962, we picked up a new mission, training ethnic minorities into a paramilitary organization called the Civilian Irregular Defense Group. The first camp was in the central highlands at a place called Boonie Nau. The team was commanded by Captain Ron Shackleton. Before he had the camp running, more than 3,000 Montagnards, the tribal people of the central highlands, had walked from as far as 100 miles away because they had heard they could get training to resist the Viet Cong. In time, we had more than 50 camps, each with an A-team or half an A-team, six to 12 Americans advising about 500 Vietnamese nationals. My first mission was as executive officer of one of those teams, A-424 from Okinawa, commanded by Captain Cruz McCullough. The team was known as McCullough's Airborne Tigers, McCats for short. This is Cruz on a previous tour in Thailand. In Vietnam, he became more relaxed. Our method of operation was to gain the respect of the local Jirai tribes people and use them as an intelligence source. The Jirai have a high incidence of leprosy, 0.6%, and we collaborated with the Agency for International Development and Christian missionaries to build a leper colony. Our medics treated almost 9,000 people in six months. When we asked where the VC were, they told us. Crew's most spectacular mission was to open up a road 30 miles north to Platon Anglais. It had been closed since the French left. The Vietnamese planned to reopen it in a year with an engineer battalion. Cruz opened it in a week with one company of CIDG and some trucks. He also killed six enemy and recaptured a village that had been kidnapped as slave labor by the Viet Cong. My own best operation was a night ambush that annihilated a high-level North Vietnamese delegation. It was a 16-hour patrol, me and 12 Montagnards. No air support, no artillery support, no radio. We reacted to positive intelligence, set up on a trail, and opened fire in the moonlight from a range of about eight feet. The day after that patrol, our boss, Colonel Ted Leonard, inspected the camp. With him was a civilian, author Robin Moore. Robin won a special place in our hearts by going through jump school and the Special Forces Qualification course before he came to Vietnam. He made three more jumps and ran combat operations for six months. I think the, the, the scariest thing is when you're ambushed. When it first, the first rounds come in and you hit the ground and I got my heels down lower than my feet, if you can imagine, you, you know, you got the heels down there. And I was really inspecting the ants down there. And uh, then uh, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Pronier, again, who I went on quite a few patrols with, said, all right, let's get up and get them. And that took guts, get up into and charge right into an ambush where they're firing at you. And uh, every time that that happened to me, we won. I mean, they just took off running because they couldn't believe everybody was getting up. Special Forces also had a number of reconnaissance units. The projects Delta, Sigma, and Omega which worked within the borders of South Vietnam, and others that worked for the MACV Studies and Observation Group in North Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Of all the SOG recon units, the most dangerous was Command and Control North. CCN had maybe 35 or 40 Americans running recons, two or three Americans, and four or five Vietnamese nationals, usually Montagnards or Chinese Nungs. The Americans had a rumored 200% annual casualty rate and one of the CCN commanders told me that his unit had accounted for the deaths of more than two divisions of NVA, mostly by going among them and calling in air. Ken Kelch was executive officer of the recon company at CCN. He is now a well-known cinematographer and is director of photography for this program. 
Cliff Newman was a recon team leader at CCN. When I first joined the Army, I didn't know where Vietnam was. And when I got into Special Forces, I kept hearing stories about Vietnam and these guys talking their, their war stories. And I mean, I wanted to be one of them. Uh, so I volunteered for Vietnam uh, after a considerable amount of training. When I got to Vietnam, I heard that uh, the MACV SOG, uh, Studies and Observations Group, was where it was happening. I had no idea what they were doing. I raised my hand for that and was accepted. Then I heard that CCN, which stood for Command and Control North, was where it was really happening. And I raised my hand for that, still not knowing exactly what they were doing. Once I got to CCN, I heard Recon Company was the essence. You know, I mean, that was where the real guys worked. I raised my hand for Recon Company. Again, still not knowing exactly what they were doing. And uh, I found out what they were doing, which I did for about two years after, from then on. And that was running uh, intelligence gathering operations with indigenous personnel that we had hired, fed, trained, a uh, small six-man, usually a six-man team with two or three Americans uh, going into classified uh, areas uh, for the intelligence gathering uh, type operations. We were on an operation and another area recon and I was resting after a short movement planning the next phase of this particular mission and we heard voices and we found uh, we discovered there was a trail right near where we were and there was a uh, uh, the it was a NVA base camp that we had walked upon, and we were sitting there within four or five meters of the trail watching people walk back and forth. This happened just quite suddenly. So we decided to further investigate, and uh, we found, we discovered this base camp. Unfortunately, they discovered us, and we had to literally fight for our lives uh, to get out. We did get out, with no, no one wounded, but uh, it was quite a, quite a mix-up. We had one advantage over the NVA in what we were doing, we had TAC air. We had radios. Radios were a lifeline. Uh, so we uh, uh, retrograded to a, to a compatible LZ landing zone. The helicopters were coming to get us and we were working tactical air support to keep the enemy's heads down while we, we got out. I, I remember a lot of people lost in the two years I was involved with them. It was quite high which is sad, you know, you, friends you went there with that went on operation, you thought about them, and they didn't come back. Special Forces was in Vietnam for 16 years. Even when we weren't there, it was all we thought about. It became a way of life. My friend Larry Dring had five tours in Vietnam, five Purple Hearts, two Silver Stars. For the last three tours, he commanded the same Mobile Strike Force company. The Mike Forces were airborne battalions of Vietnamese ethnics who functioned as reaction forces. They ran mobile guerrilla operations deep in enemy territory. The war was such a way of life to Larry that he met his wife in a firefight. I always introduce her and says, uh, this, is my wife, this is my wife, I met her in a gunfight. You know, ho, ho, ho. Third time I ever saw in my life, I had a slug in my back, one in my leg, I'm laying on the deck. My radio man come to get me, he got blown up. My medic come to get me, he got shot, and they dragged me in the, off the street, kick open the nearest door, there's four nurses and a doctor, you know. There she is, you know, ten of us in there, three of them are dead. You know, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? This is Tet 68 in the Trong, the day the battle came to town to us. Most of these guys were clerks in the headquarters who had made it into the Green Berets only to have somebody find out they could type. For most, this was the one fight of their tour and they relished it. They also did very well. At this place, we didn't lose anybody and we killed over 200 of the enemy. For a while, we had a company of Mike Force with us. This is Sergeant Sammy Coots of Cupertino, California, pulling a Vietnamese girl out of the line of fire of the Viet Cong. Lieutenant Joe Zamara was killed in another fight about two hours later. Captain Larry O'Neill was badly wounded in that same fight. Tet was a great victory for the Allies, and morale was sky high all over Vietnam, at least until the press reports that said exactly the opposite came out. Vietnam left us with a lot of memories, good and bad. 
but we accomplished every mission we were given and we learned to defeat the war of national liberation strategy. Vietnam was not really a separate war. It was a long campaign in the Cold War. And if it weren't for Vietnam, I don't think the Soviet Union would have fallen. They would have conquered countries and sucked them dry, enough to keep their economy afloat. But events were soon to prove that even the best organized force is no better than its support base. In 1971, legendary commander Colonel Bull Simons, later to become famous in the book and movie Wings of Eagles, led a raid to rescue American prisoners of war in North Vietnam. The raid went flawlessly, except that the CIA had failed to learn that the POWs had been moved. In April of 1980, another raid precipitated a disaster with far greater consequences. Under Colonel Charles Beckwith, Delta Force, a joint task force composed primarily of SF people, launched a raid to free the hostages held in the American Embassy in Tehran. The total force consisted of Air Force C-130s, U.S. Marine Sea Stallion helicopters, and the Delta Force commandos. Operational security prevented these elements from training into a cohesive unit. We knew it was a high-risk mission. We accepted that fact. But the ground force people who were going to do it felt confident. And you can talk to people today, they'll still say the same things. We didn't train with the, with the helicopter crews as close as some of us would have liked. Uh, we flew with them several times, but we were just passengers sitting in the back. We didn't know them personally. And, and always my team, you know, this is Mike Waite saying, I wanted them to know that they were coming to get Mike Waite, not, not just somebody there. And we didn't have that, that closeness, and uh, we should have. After flying 600 miles blacked out at night through two unexpected dust storms, the Marines arrived with five flyable helicopters when six were needed. The decision to abort was made. Unfortunately, in repositioning one of the helicopters to refuel, to allow it to go back, it uh, crashed into one of the C-130 tankers, and eight people were killed. I'm saying this from hindsight. At, at the time, we wanted to get on the helicopters and, and go do it. Uh, but, you know, after the, as the years rolled by, that was a very hard decision uh, to make, uh, but it was probably the right decision. Special operations forces today that have grown out of that experience and, the, and look at the capabilities that we now possess, that, that can't be considered a failure. That was the beginning of the new modern special forces. The creation of the U.S. Special Operations Command marked the maturation of the third generation of Green Berets. As an alumnus of the second, I had great curiosity about what they and their training might be like. In the old boy network, you heard that they were either better than we were in every way or perfect corporate soldiers who might or might not have the flexibility to face the kind of challenge we faced in Vietnam. The toughest thing about it was you didn't really know what was coming up next. They would brief you, this is what you've got to do today. They didn't tell you how to do it. They didn't tell you how long you had to do it. Just the answer was always, do the best you can. If you ask questions, that's usually the response you got, do the best you can. So you never knew if you were running against the clock, if you were running against the standard. And that was probably the most difficult part about it because you just had to, like they said, do the best you could short of collapsing and hope that it was good enough. And as you found out as you went along, it wasn't good enough for a lot of people because they did weed out over two-thirds of the selection class itself. I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the camaraderie built, you know, it's going through the course and uh, the training I've been able to use and it, it's been nice to be able to help people in different parts of the world with the medical training that I've received. A lot of times when you're deployed, it's just you and your team. There are no other Americans there. There might not be anyone else who speaks English. So you're, you kind of have to rely on each other for that emotional support or you know, for the support of your friends, and you work very tight with each other. And even when we're back in, you know, when we're here, we, uh, 
you know, we always kind of stick together. We're kind of a family. When I was in South America, I met a guy who was a special forces guy from Vietnam. You know, I told him who I was, and we were, we instantly had rapport. You know, we, we shared something in common. It's, that's the, just the kind of family it is. Basically, it's a level of trust, the level of impact that I have. As a captain, I can't imagine being given the latitude uh, to do some of the things that I've done. Colonel Krauss, uh, Colonel Davis gave me the latitude. I sent guys O'Connor on my, on my voice approval alone. I sent guys uh, to support the Mogadishu uh, uh, evacuation uh, in January. He gave me the mission. He let me run it. And he never second-guessed me. Uh, and I can't imagine some of the things that, that I've done just on, on my own power as a, as a captain during the time uh, ever being given that, that latitude to uh, work on such a, a large, significant scale uh, if I was in the infantry. The new generation found its baptism of fire in Operation Desert Storm. We had pretty well saturated the battlefield with, uh, with Special Forces soldiers. And let me tell you what that means. With all the coalition forces, which was about two corps worth, the Egyptian uh, Corps, well, two divisions plus a Ranger Regiment, Syrian Division plus a special Syrian Special Forces a Brigade, uh, three, six Kuwaiti Brigades, and uh, those things, they kept popping up all over the place. Uh, there were four. Saudi brigades, and with those brigades were Special Forces soldiers. Now, prior to Desert Storm, during Desert Shield, those soldiers trained with these brigades. They helped these brigades. Uh, the Special Forces soldier provided that continuity. Now, you got to understand that uh, those units could not talk to one another. Uh, we had a division that was mixed with Saudis and Kuwaitis. It makes you a division, but put, uh, put the three brigades together. We'll call this a division. Uh, but there is no, no, uh, uh, no way to command and control them. Our guys were able to do that. I put guys out with the lead elements of each one of those forces, down to battalion and sometimes company level. Those forces, the Special Forces soldiers, uh, planned the breaches of the minefields and made sure that the, you know, the forces they were with got through those minefields. Uh, they took the objectives, they moved the forces to the objectives, and in some instances even took an objective in one instance that I know. Now, actually, there are two instances when those objectives were taken by, by the Special Forces soldiers assigned to, to, to a given brigade. I had, uh, there were Special Forces soldiers cleared to the left flank of the battlefield, and when you're talking about a battlefield that stretches left to right, four to six hundred miles, and, and I forget the, exactly what it was, but it was a long, probably about four hundred miles. Awful wide battlefield. Uh, we had uh, Special Forces guys with the Marine Divisions, with the Marine Headquarters, with the 18th Airborne Corps, with the 82nd, with the French on the left flank. The Air Force is going, in, going to go in and prep the site for us, but for some of those locations that the Air Force can't quite get into, might be a little bit too close to some towns or a little bit too close to the civilian population, then that's where the SF teams or some of your LERS teams or some of you guys, we're going to go in there with you, pinpoint those targets, put some beacons on them, and then have the aircraft come on in there and knock them on out, do a little bit more strategic work with them. If we don't have the option that we can utilize the beacons, then we'll go on in there and take that bad boy out ourselves, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the other thing that we provided for the coalition forces was close air support. Uh, and uh, Each of the teams trained a lot in uh, providing close air support, and uh, that was one of the missions that uh, they performed during Desert Storm. And even uh, Desert Shield, of course, they trained a lot with it. Uh, the other thing uh, that uh, we determined was part of ground truth was the, uh, the unit's capabilities. It's one thing for a battalion or a regiment or a brigade to say, hey, I'm going to continue attack, but if he doesn't have uh, ammunition, if he's getting low on, on fuel, uh, many of the other things uh, that is required in order to, to, uh, to continue pressing forward, if he doesn't have that, then he can say, hey, I'm going to continue to attack all he wants to, but he ain't going to attack very far. It's important to know that. Uh, the other thing uh, during Desert Shield or the other mission uh, that we performed during Desert Shield and Storm was, was a special reconnaissance. 140 miles, 150 miles deep. Uh, eight teams uh, in support of the main attack uh, north of the Euphrates River. Uh, really some interesting stories. Real heroes came out of that mission. 
from the release point to the LZ, the, the pilot just started uh, ticking off things on our left and our right. Camp right, guns left, guns left, camp right, camp left, and ask me, it's your call. I'm looking out there with my nods, seeing all this stuff, and it's not supposed to be there. Uh, we had information, but it just turned out to be that we didn't have as current information as we thought. There were a lot of people in there, supposed to be fairly uninhabited, but we got to the LZ. We'd come a long way, and we'd been isolating for, uh, for three or four weeks, and so we got out. The strange thing was is that as the helicopter left the ground, the, uh, the decibel level of the noise didn't change. It just changed from being one of helicopter turbines to the barking of like probably about 40 dogs that have surrounded us once we infilled. Now, obviously these dogs belong to someone and uh, those people weren't supposed to be there. All these dogs are surrounding us and then uh, my communicator tapped me on the shoulder and pointed over, over my left shoulder and there was a, an Iraqi soldier out there shining his flashlight about 70 meters away. And I decided, well, you know, what I'll do, I just, shot, I just shot right over the dog. Well, lucky for me, that happened to be the charm because when they heard that bullet come tearing through the brush right after them, and they all shut up and left. We were never less than 200 meters away from an Iraqi camp encampment or people. We moved as best we could towards our high position. Then about uh, 5.30 in the morning, it started to break dusk and we found a place to hide for the day. It was, uh, unfortunately, it was above ground the whole time. And uh, so we set up as best we could underneath the palm tree and pulled some scrub in around us and on top of us. We uh, set out the, and as I was finishing off and it was getting light, uh, setting out the claymore, everything like that, and I happened to look over to my left, and about 50 meters over to my left, there's a, uh, an Iraqi warming his hands over a fire that he was just starting. So we knew it was going to be a long and eventful day. Later that day, about uh, 1 in the afternoon, this is a G day now, the, we heard a lot of firing and uh, explosions about four clicks to our north. Well, you know, I turned and looked to our, my intel sergeant and smiled because I knew what was happening up there was only that somebody had just walked into a hornet's nest and met up with my team sergeant and the other two guys from my team. The kids playing in the field uh, did, in fact, discover one of the teams, and of course, you know, what to do now. Well, the final, uh, the final, uh, the outcome was that uh, this team, after uh, holding off uh, an Iraqi company for approximately three hours, and uh, as the uh, team sergeant, headed by a master sergeant, as, as the team sergeant said, he said, hey, we've made up our mind, our mama wasn't going to see us on television. So they were out there, they were out there to stay. Every one of them, excellent marksmen, every one had graduated uh, from, uh, from sniper training. So they were picking off targets uh, with, and they had uh, M16A2s, they were picking off targets out to, out to 800 meters. We were fighting for a life. I mean, we had to kill people to stop them from coming. There was one guy that got up on a building, and I call him the, a traffic cop. He got up on the building, started waving his hands, directing traffic, directing the troops in. Well, he didn't last long, I took him out. We pulled them out after three hours, and this was, uh, uh, they were pulled out by, uh, uh, by Jim Cristofoli of the uh, 3rd Battalion, 160th, flying right along that desert, as fast as he could go and as low as he could go. And as mentioned earlier, you know, he said he even had to pull up a couple times to get over some donkeys fast. And sure enough, about an hour and a half later, we saw uh, a helicopter fly by, there's one of ours. And at that time, we pulled out our radio to see what was going on, the SATCOM. And, uh, where, much to our chagrin, we, know, we uh, found out that our radio was no longer in operating condition. So, uh, after moving it, trying to reconfigure, checking everything, double checking everything, throughout the rest of the afternoon and evening, it still did not work. I said, okay, no sweat, we'll go back and get the PRC-70. Uh, so we can use that. Well, we went back over there and someone else had set up their camp on top of where we'd cached it. So now there was no way we were gonna get that radio either. I decided that we'd tr better try to dig in. Because we'd spent weeks rehearsing digging in and making these hide sites uh, that were just 
flush with the ground. You couldn't tell what was there. It looked like it was the same old stuff. Well, every time we started, found a place and started digging in, we'd get shot at. A dog would bark at us. Shots would just scatter all around us and above our heads. And uh, so we'd pick up and move to another place. Well, we'd get shot at again because uh, I guess these these dogs were doing their their job fairly well, being good watchdogs. And the um, the reaction to their barking was an immediately uh, to empty a magazine in the general direction. So uh, we moved all night again, trying to find a place. And we finally realized we we're not having enough time to dig, so we found the shallow ditch under this palm tree. All day we, uh, we watched people were going uh, in front of us. Dogs never, they saw us. I'm, I'm positive the dogs saw us, but they never came over to us. Uh, with the ex one exception, uh, one young boy walked by and had a small dog with him. And the small dog stuck his head inside there and barked at my commo man and just really, uh, he, you saw him jump. I'm surprised uh, he didn't utter a sound at the time. But uh, yeah, we had people walk within about six feet of us on either side of us. And I was trying to remember where the last car was that I saw that was in operating condition. <laughs> Later that night, we were, we were anxious for darkness to come all three days that we were there because we knew that we could walk in and out. We walked in and out of their camps all three nights. And uh, we were never seen by them because so we had nods. The moon was up. The moon was full. And if uh, they'd had the night vision equipment that we had, we would have uh, we wouldn't have gone quite as far as we did. When we set up the uh, LZ waiting for them, uh, they didn't show. Later, we found out it was because they weren't released from uh, the, inter the intermediate staging base because of the weather. Uh, we were really uh, over the fear probably at this time, but we were anxious for something to happen. If something was going to happen, we wanted to go one way or another. And then uh, that night. Uh, about midnight, we were packing up our stuff to get moving again. And uh, we were sitting right on top of the Exfil PZ. And uh, we figured if they were going to come that night, it would be around 3 o'clock, 3 a.m., uh, which was a prearranged time. And then uh, about midnight, all of a sudden, uh, I looked over at uh, Sergeant Starling, who was the intel sergeant. And he looked back over at me, and I heard the unmistakable sound of UH-60s. And, uh, and no, no sooner we heard it than, we, than it all of a sudden became, became real clear. And we saw one. And uh, Sergeant Starling had never seen him move so fast. He was out of that brush and holding up uh, an infrared strobe light within about two seconds. And I, was, uh, I had used the, uh, finally used my uh, PRC-90 to, uh, to call them in. And uh, they came right down where we, uh, we just hopped in and uh, moved out. Once we got into Kuwait, the mission was uh, to clear Kuwait City. Uh, we had that responsibility along with the Kuwaiti counterparts to, to do that. Uh, much like the battlefield, there, weren't, uh, there was not a lot of resistance in Kuwait City. Doesn't mean there wasn't any, any resistance because there were those guys, that, uh, those Iraqi soldiers that woke up you know, the next morning and kind of looked around and said, where the hell is everybody, and found out that they were left there. So there were some guys left back in Kuwait City that, uh, that uh, did not make it uh, necessarily a cakewalk. As the uh, Iraqis left Kuwait City, they left their positions with weapons and with ammunition. And everybody in Kuwait City that didn't want a weapon had one. Everybody that wanted a weapon had two. And all, all the ammunition was with a tremendous, you know, a, a, a tremendous problem. I mean, there was just gunfire all over the place. None of them the Iraqis. Kuwaitis, you know, celebrating, firing the weapons up in the air. Uh, not necessarily a real dangerous, but by the same token, you know, it, it was kind of kind of unnerving because you're never really sure who the hell was firing those weapons. Um, but uh, during the uh, uh, during the stay in Kuwait City, then again operating, and uh, what the Kuwaiti brigades did, move it, moving in sector, established uh, brigade headquarters at the, at a local uh, uh, police station or a local army headquarters, a local school, and from there began to slowly assert control until uh, uh, they're ready to bring back in the, uh, the rest of the, the, Kuwaiti, the Kuwaiti National Police. And then, by, and then uh, we uh, slipped out of Kuwait and slipped out of Saudi and went back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. The most amazing thing about Special Forces' performance in Desert Storm was their combat casualties. They didn't have any. 
Not one man killed or seriously wounded in combat against the Iraqis. They were just very good and the other guys weren't. For three generations now, pretty much the same kinds of guys have joined special forces. But fate has dealt each generation a far different hand. The World War II guys, not just OSS, but everybody, literally saved the world from a new dark age. In Vietnam, we earned the kind of bitter honor that comes from fighting well in a lost cause. And the Desert Storm generation proved once more that brave men will always have to stand against tyrants. The numbers don't really mean much. The spirit is all. Thank you.